Hello, and welcome to the July Third Thursday program presented by the Hoover Presidential Foundation. I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Foundation, and I'd like to start by thanking our partners in this program, the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum, the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site, and the West Branch Public Library. And this month, we're especially pleased to welcome the Urbandale, Waterloo, and Davenport Public Libraries, as well as the Carnegie Stout Library in Dubuque. Together, this group is expanding tonight's message all across Iowa, and we're so glad that you could all join us for th this evening. For now, the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum remains closed to the school, or to the public rather, and is working on a plan for a phased reopening. The National Historic Site grounds and historic buildings are now open to the public. However, the Visitor Center remains closed for the time being. The Hoover Presidential Foundation office is open and is also available by email and phone. As you view tonight's webinar, we invite you to enter questions through the Q&A feature you'll find along the edge of your screen. You may also vote for questions someone else has entered if you'd like to hear those answered. As we may not have time to answer all the questions provided, top vote getters will get asked first. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Elizabeth Dinschel. Elizabeth is an archivist and education specialist for the National Archives and Records Administration at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. Elizabeth, thank you for being here tonight and bringing in our very special guest. Thank you, Jerry. Welcome, everybody. Um, I want to provide a little bit of background for you. Uh, in 1954, the Supreme Court handed down the decision for Brown versus Board of Education. That ruling declared that separate can never be equal, opening the door for school desegregation. I would love to tell you this happened quickly, but it did not. Desegregation, desegregation efforts were blocked or met with violent mobs. In 1957, nine children were chosen to enter Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. With us tonight is Dr. Terrence Roberts, and he was one of those nine students. Thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Roberts. I'm gonna kick off a question for Dr. Roberts to kind of get you guys' minds going and start answering questions into the Q&A box for me to moderate with Dr. Roberts. Um, and I'm gonna also put some links in the chat box for you guys to learn more about the Little Rock Nine and the history of that event. Dr. Roberts, can you start off by telling us about how you were selected to attend Central High School and what that first year of school was like for you? Well, the truth of the matter is that all nine of us were self-selected. I know you may read conflicting reports about that in various and sundry books and articles, but the Little Rock School Board determined after a time, three years after the Supreme Court decision, that they would make an effort to comply. They finally determined that one high school would be selected, Central High, school prior to that time designated for white students only. They sent representatives to the two schools where eligible black kids were, the one high school and the one middle school that serviced all of the black kids in Little Rock. And the question was posed, at assemblies in those two institutions, how many of you would join us in this experiment? There were about, I guess, 150 round total. Then we went home and explained to our parents that we'd volunteered, at which point those numbers dwindle very quickly, down to 10. For a very brief moment in time, we were the Little Rock 10. That only lasted a couple of days because the father of the 10th child received a telephone call from his employer with a very terse message, if you continue in this madness, don't bother coming back to work. So out of fear for losing any kind of income stream that he could depend upon, he pulled her out. Tragically, he was fired anyway. So that's how it all happened. All right, um, we have a question from Kelly Steffen. And she says, in 2009, I attended a National Park Service workshop at Central High School. I was able to meet Elizabeth Eckford and Minnie Jean Brown Tricky. Minnie Jean spoke about the Chile incident. Can you share with us what you recall about that matter? 
Yes, it was a very intriguing matter. <laughs> we, the nine, had taken a vow of nonviolence for that school year. We weren't going to fight. But the pressure was intense. And one day in the cafeteria, Minnie Jean was pushed to her limit and dumped her tray of food on the head of one of the students. Uh, the following day, uh, some student dumped food on her. After that point, Minnie Jean decided she would just give up on nonviolence. And her reasoning was this. She said, these kids don't seem to speak the language of nonviolence. They're speaking the language of violence. In order for me to communicate successfully with them, I need to speak their language. So she began to beat kids up, at which point the school officials decided that it was time to expel her. And they did. They kicked her out of school. The upshot of that was the following day, little cards were circulated all over campus. One down, eight to go. And I suppose the reasoning was that since one of us had reached a breaking point, it was a matter of time before all of us did so. But the eight of us simply rekindled our desire to be nonviolent and toughed it out. It was much harder after that. That happened in February of 58. So those coming months until the end of school were tremendously, overpoweringly cruel. And yet we, uh, we all survived. I don't know how, I, honestly. I, I can't tell you in any uh, you know, rational way how it was that we survived that onslaught, but we did. And seven of us were ready to go back. With Minnie Jean's expulsion and Ernie's graduation, that left nine, seven of us. So we were, at that point, the Little Rock Seven, ready to go back. And we let the governor know of our intentions, which didn't make him pleased at all. He, he in fact, he came up with a plan to thwart our efforts to return. And his plan was to simply close down all high schools in Little Rock. Schools for whites, schools for blacks, all schools, all high schools rather, closed in Little Rock. And they remained closed for that entire school year. That was his way of saying to the Brown decision, you can take yours and go where you want to with it. We want none of it. So as a consequence, I actually left town. I finished high school in Los Angeles simply because there were no public schools available. And I didn't have funds for private school. And besides that, I had relatives in Los Angeles who'd always said, if you have need, we are here. I took them up on it. And my entire family moved. Actually, I moved out in August. My entire family, parents and other siblings, moved out in December of 58. So we became Californians at that point. So a follow up to that. Um, also from Kelly, is what is your memory about interacting with the white students? Well, the interaction that we had was essentially uh, violent. And it was about their pushing for us to leave. The message was very clear from the beginning. Either you leave or we'll kill you and drag you out. That was not universally held. I mean, there were a few white students, of course, as is with any group. You'll never find unanimity of thought. But their numbers were few, simply because there was also another edict on campus to the white students. And it went like this, if you do anything that might be considered friendly to the black students, we will kill you too. So there wasn't much incentive for the white students to reach out. Although uh, some did, which is really you know, interesting because in most situations like that, you don't find many people at all who are willing to step up and uh, make their thoughts or feelings known. So we have another question from Gregory Norfleet, and he says, can you compare the feel of the 1950s racial tension to what's going on today? Well, in a sense, yes, but I'd like to put it in context of the historical record for this entire country. See, none of this is new. None of this is new. We can go back to the year 1619 as a starting point. That was the year, 1619, when one shipload of people from Africa were brought here to begin work as free laborers, labor without recompense. In 1619, the institution of, of slavery had not yet been developed, but not long after that, it most certainly was. And the numbers of people brought in from Africa increased dramatically. 
But from the start, the big issue was now, how do we deal with this as a group of people here already in America who are Christian people? And it goes against their Christian grain to enslave people. So in order to make this work, they have to then create a mythological construct that suggests that black people are actually non-human. They're inferior to whites. And so it's okay if they're enslaved. So when you think about that kind of start and that continuing for centuries, then the comparison is that as the years went by, there were always people who were pushing back against that, not very successfully, but continuous. The effort we made in 57 was simply part of the paradigm. We were in line with what our ancestors had done in an effort to force this country to treat us as the you know, ethos of the country suggested, all men created equal, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, but yeah, so in that sense, it's very comparable to what was going on. And by the way, what will go on uh, past this year, 2020. Don't expect Nirvana in 2021. So uh, we have this question from Julia Labau. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce that correctly. Um, how much of what happened to you at school did you share with your parents and what was their reaction? Well, uh, not very much. You know, teenagers don't talk to parents very much. <laughs> and my parents and I had a tacit understanding that we would lie to each other. So I'd come home from school and the question would be, well, how was your day? And I would respond, fine, how was your day? Really good. Now, we both knew we were lying. They'd not had a very good day. I'd not had a very good day at all either. But I think, uh, without even giving voice to it, we figured out that this was a way, not the best way possible, but a way to preserve our equilibrium, to keep us mentally stable during these very crazy times. All right, our next question comes from Hank Deslauer. He says, Dr. Roberts, thank you for your efforts. I teach in an inner city school. I often tell my students that you and the other eight had to give up everything in order to attend. Football games, band, chorus, dances. Can you speak to that? Well, yes, that's quite true. In fact, we had to sign an affidavit that we, the nine, would not engage in any extracurricular activities. It was a condition that uh, would have canceled the program had we not signed. So yeah, we gave that up. Although uh, I don't think any of the nine of us saw it as giving anything up. When you compare what we were trying to do, which was to overthrow this whole system of segregation, to miss out on some dances or games uh, seemed unimportant. Seems unimportant today, really. And this question comes from Julie Finch and it kind of piggybacks on that. She said, how did the nine of you support one another and how did the family, your families and community support each other? Well, I think um, the best way to, to put that is all nine of the families were 100% behind our decision to volunteer. That spoke volumes in itself. The language my parents used was this, we will support your decision, your decision to volunteer. We will support your decision 100%. And if you get up there and find that it's much too much for you and you want to quit, we will support your decision to quit 100%. Now that was very, very telling and very important for me to hear. I had the best of all worlds. I could stay or leave without fear of losing even one iota of parental esteem. That's, that's always valuable. And that was echoed by family members, neighbors, other people who knew me. I knew I had a cadre of people who were always supportive of what I was doing. And if I chose to end my involvement, that was fine too. I would suffer no recrimination as a consequence. So I, I think that, you know, that's the kind of thing you need in life, anybody needs. You need to have people in your corner who will support you whatever decision you make because they trust you to make the healthiest decision. Thank you. So we have a question from Dale and lots of votes for this one. Um, they wanna know how you guys were treated by the teachers. 
Well, <laughs> that's almost a question you can answer for yourself if you understand U.S. history and understand that this year was 1957 and we were in the so-called South. What do you think? Well, that's rhetorical. I'll answer it anyway. The, <laughs> the teachers didn't like us, you know, not at all. And again, not every single teacher held that attitude. And I want to stress that point again. Whatever group of people you have, you're going to have individual thought going on. The other thing you'll have, because of our whole notion about being in groups, is you'll have very few people who are brave enough to speak their truth if they deem that their truth will be different from the truth spoken by the majority of the others. So even though I knew there were some individual teachers who would probably support our presence, they were reluctant to give voice to it for fear of suffering all kinds of pushback from their friends and neighbors because they had to live with these folk. You know, we went every day and we got beaten up every day, but we could go home and we wouldn't have to deal with that stuff. Well, our, that's not quite true because we had to deal with drive-bys, but, but you get the point. Uh, teachers in the main were divided along a continuum. At one extreme, there were those who hated us with vile passion. At the other extreme were a few, few teachers who just by their demeanor and their facial expressions told me that it was okay with them if we were there. They were few in number because most of them tended to cluster at that extreme end. And I'll give you one illustration of one of those at that extreme end. This was my 11th grade English teacher. I knew on day one when I walked into her class, I made the assumption that I would receive an F in this woman's class just by the face she wore when I walked in. You know, and that's, that's very valuable information. You can read faces, most of us can, and you know what a face is telling you, regardless of the words. She didn't really have many words, but she had the face. So I just assumed she would mark an F on my report card. She confronted me one day in class, and she says, why do you want to come to our school? Why don't you go back to your own school? Now, that's very interesting language for an English teacher, especially. I assumed that there was something wrong with her, probably a mental health problem, by the way she phrased the question. She has an inferences in this question that she and I both have some ownership in these public institutions, i.e. her school, my school. I, I knew this was wrong. But then my second thought was, how do you communicate with somebody who seems that twisted? So I just smiled and walked off. But at the end of term, guess what grade I got? I got an A. Oh yeah, not an F, I got an A. And I told a friend of mine about it and he started laughing. <laughs> he couldn't stop laughing. I said, what's better with you? He said, well, don't you understand? Haven't you figured it out? That woman gave you an A because she wanted to cancel all possibility that you would repeat her class. <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it. Although the more I thought about it, my conclusion was the woman couldn't deny genius when she saw it, regardless of her feelings about me. But there you go. You never know. So uh, Jackie Ogleson has asked, can you speak about the role that the National Guard um, and then the Army played in your year at school? Yes, yes. And it, it's important to talk about this because as we see today, uh, young people, and they're mostly young people, who are on the front line in the armed forces, you don't find many old geezers out there on the front line. You know, they've already reached the rank of commanding officers so they can sit back in the cool of the tent while the foot soldiers go out there in the heat of the day and fight the battles. Well, these young men and women, well, actually just men in, in both these groups, the Guard and the 101st Airborne, they were young and they had to follow orders. They were ordered in the first instance with the National Guard to keep us out of Central High School. The second group, the military, the 101st Airborne, were charged with the responsibility of getting us in and keeping us there. It was all about obeying orders. So the National Guard had to follow orders. The 101st soldiers had to follow orders. And in the military, what I've discovered is they have this chain of command arrangement where some person at the top, usually a general or somebody like that, gives orders and everyone underneath has to follow those, regardless of whether or not the, the general has no brain or not, could be brainless, dumb as dirt, but still gives an order and people have to follow that. Which by the way, is one of the reasons why I could never ever serve in a military unit unless I were the general, 
No, that's another thing. But in any case, I think they, they did follow orders. And in one sense, that was good because with them blindly following orders, especially the ones who were ordered to keep us in, we had less to worry about. All right, so this question comes from Ilana Asher. She said, I have the pleasure of hearing you speak at the Boston Public Library. I was lucky enough to visit Little Rock, Arkansas and see Daisy Bates's house. Can you please share her importance to the Little Rock Nine and maybe share a favorite story you have about this amazing woman? Well, Daisy and her husband, L.C. Bates, were important people in terms of keeping the flame alive in the fight for civil rights in Little Rock. They co-owned a newspaper, the State Press. And in that paper, they were always pushing for change in the system. Years and years before Central High School was ever on the scene, they were holding aloft the banner that it is time for change. And I think uh, Daisy Bates herself had come through such a horrific experience as a black woman in the South. So that too was part of what she was carrying around. She had been, uh, you know, just brought up under terrible circumstances as a young person and had to contend with the uh, rapacious white males in the area. Uh, which has always been the plight of, of black women, especially in that region of the South. So she had real ample reason for pushing for real change so that uh, her life could be balanced and allow her to maximize whatever potential she had uh, given to her in her DNA. But I think uh, one of the things that I remember about her most was she was fearless. We often met at her home and the home was dynamited more than once. So we were often worried about whether or not we'd all be blown up. And I recall one evening when the uh, young man who brought the paper, during that time in Little Rock, we had two papers. We had the morning paper and the evening paper. This was the evening paper. And we all heard uh, a thump at the door and then the screeching of tires as somebody taking off really fast. So everybody assumed it was a bomb. So we all ran down to the basement and hunkered down. Meanwhile, Daisy was, going out to get the paper. That's what had happened. Paper boy, he was so frightened because he thought it was dangerous to be in the neighborhood. His dad had driven him there rather than him coming on his bicycle. And he quickly threw the paper, jumped back in the car and off they sped, giving the impression or creating the illusion that a bomb had been thrown. But uh, Daisy, I think because she was so accustomed to bombs that, that this one thing she had already catalog that the paper would be coming and she understood what it was. So that illustrates her ability to live under fire. And I think that's an amazing trait for anybody to have. Okay, um, I think actually this is probably a good follow up to that because we're talking about how dangerous it was to, to be um, a black person in the South. So Kathy Breimeyer asks, how did your experience as being one of the Little Rock Nine shape the way that you viewed white people in the United States? And how did being one of the Little Rock Nine impact your emotional health? Well, I count myself really fortunate to have grown up in a household with a mom who understood a lot of things well beyond her years, well beyond her peer group for that matter. There were seven kids, I have six siblings, and she taught all of us that this whole construct of race was mythological. We all grew up understanding that there truly was no such thing as race. So we dealt with people on the basis of who they said they were. We allowed them to say to us who they were, whether they were so-called white people or so-called black people didn't matter. So I never grew up with this division in my mind about who's white and who's black. I simply saw individuals other than myself, and I could deal with them based on who they said they were. Now, that's important. In fact, that's why I count myself privileged, because I've talked to a lot of people, both black and white, who've grown up with certain fears and anxieties relating to the, quote, others out there, because they define themselves by racial groups. It's very debilitating, and when you think about it, uh, because if you buy into the notion of race and you buy into this construct that concludes that all these people are a certain way or all those other people are a certain way, you really don't have a chance to figure out who people truly are. But 
part of my message as I go around the world speaking to people is to get them to understand that you do not have to put people into little groups in order to relate to them, assuming that you know about them because you understand their group culture or their group assignment. So as a consequence, uh, my view of white people uh, is non-existent, but my view of people, very keen, very focused. And I'm interested in people. I wanna know who they are, what they think, why they think the way they think. Uh, and that serves me well. In fact, that's part of the gospel message I preach to people wherever I am. You know, get rid of these confining elements that keep you tethered to a pernicious way of thinking, i.e. that people belong in certain racial groups. And I know, I know that probably some of you watching who feel that you are a part of a racial group and you're proud of it. <laughs> I remember a speaker once saying, if you were to go out on the street corner and just poll people as they walk by, are you a member of a racial group? They'll probably say yes, and which one? Some of them might say, well, I'm proud to be this racial group or that racial group, which is all nonsense, but there you have it. And I think once people begin to truly learn as much as they can about the mythology of race, we as a group of people in this country will be much better off, much better off. By the way, I think we're a long way from that simply because this stuff is so deeply embedded in our psyche. Some of us truly believe that there's a scientific basis for race. Even the, even the profession of medicine who gets bogged down in this a lot. And I have a tough time sometimes working with physicians who assume that they can prescribe for me based on the general way you treat black people. Now that makes no sense at all. No, but there it is. All right. So this one comes from Frank Wilson, and he said, how would you characterize the quality of education that you experienced in 1957? And how is it compared to your previous and following years of school? When I was in uh, first grade at the segregated Gibbs Elementary School, my first grade teacher told all of us six-year-olds that we had to take on executive responsibility for learning. I believed her. So in September of 1947, I established the Terry Roberts Learning Academy. I took charge of my learning. So my education has always been superior because I make sure that I get the best possible. Now, things change based on the situation around the law, the custom, etc. For instance, as a kid in Little Rock, by law, I could not attend certain schools. I couldn't even go to the public library because I was black. That's what the law said. But as the executive in charge of learning, I found a way around that. So I've always figured out how to educate myself, regardless of the quality of the institution, the quality of uh, the people in it, et cetera. Although there's one thing, and probably a lot of people don't know this, because of segregation, well-qualified black people couldn't get jobs in teaching unless they taught in all black schools. Now think about it for a minute. If that is the case, then the all black schools have the potential to choose from the best possible pool of teachers and administrators. So in my school career, starting at Gibbs Elementary, segregated, Dunbar Middle School, segregated, one year at Horace Mann High School, segregated, those institutions were all run by and and people who were teachers were black people, but they were superior. Now, white schools and white students didn't experience them because of segregation. They would have really benefited from that. The education we got in the all black schools was far superior to the quote education we got at Central, simply because you didn't have that same dynamic. At Central, you didn't have the people who were the best possible because people who were well qualified had so many other options. And so because of segregation, just one of those quirks, there was a plus factor that nobody even counted on, or, you know, I guess, never even thought about it. I in fact, I think the attitude toward black people in this country is such that the general idea is that no one black person is smarter than the dumbest white person. That's what I think, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. So our next question is actually from a nine-year-old girl named Maya sitting at home. 
and she wants to know if you made friends while you were at school and who was your first friend there? What can you tell us about them? Well, the truth is, Maya, everybody is my friend by definition from me. I accept everyone as my friend. Now, often people don't reciprocate. That is, they don't understand this, so they don't share friendship back. Uh, but there were white kids at Central who turned out to be quite friendly, even though they'd been told that if they were friendly toward me, they'd get killed. Now, that took a lot of courage. It took a lot of courage for a white kid to do that. But there, yeah, there were a few. Not a lot, as you might imagine, but there were a few. And so um, I'll give you one name. Her name is Robin Woods. You can look her up on the internet. Her name will pop up. Robin was in my algebra class. And Robin saw what was happening to me. On every, every day I got to school, kids would rip my books out of my arms and tear them up. I didn't have any books, really. So I would often go to class with nothing, not even a piece of paper or a pencil, just me sitting in the desk. And one day Robin pulled her desk over so we could share her book. Now that was a real act of friendliness on her part. So I would count her as my first friend. Thank you for that question. So um, we have a question from Becky Miller, and there, her question was, has anyone ever apologized to you for how you were treated? Yes, yes, they have. Uh, not, not a lot of people, no, a few. They have apologized, as you might well expect, again, given the notion that not everybody thinks the same way. Some of the kids at Central who are now adults have come forward and apologized for their behavior because they've continued to learn and grow and they are different people now. That makes a difference. But uh, like I say, not in great numbers, nope. All right, this question comes from Kate Sutter. She's a teacher, I actually know her, hi Kate. Um, and she says, I met Ann Wedeman on a trip a few years ago and she talked a little bit about the 1957 school year, what positive responses came from the white students. And as a teacher in a mostly white rural school, what lessons or stories can we encourage our students with today when they see racism and mistreatment? I, I think the best thing you can do is to help your students understand how racist ideology has developed. And you could start in the year 1619 and bring them forward, you know, take that historical journey with them so they have some background for it. It's not something that just happened overnight. It was centuries in the making and continues so. So kids need to know this. They need to understand how it all happened. And I think as you give students the information, they will figure out how to deal with it. I think a lot of people, teachers included, are often reluctant to tell kids the truth because they fear it will upset them or somehow cause them to have sleepless nights. I don't know what they're thinking. My position has always been that everybody has to know everything about everything all the time because each individual is charged with the responsibility of responding to this world. You cannot do it if you're ill-equipped in terms of information. If you don't have enough information, you can't, you can't understand anything. So kids need to know. So encourage them to learn by looking at the historical record. And secondly, and maybe we could reverse the order, maybe the first thing to do is model for the kids and excitement about learning these things yourself as teacher. If you modeled learning about these very issues yourself and you're on fire about them every single day, kids would get the message. Oh, it's important to my teacher. It must be important to me. But there you go. Try it out. That's great. I love that. That's like bringing in leadership to teaching that you hope kids will follow your lead. So we have this next question from Tom, uh, Tom Martin, and he says, what happened to the other six when all the high schools were closed? And what happened to all the white kids when the schools were closed? Well, uh, I do have a little information about the other six of us, very, very little information about the white kids, uh, but stuff I've heard, I'll share. That school year, 57, 58, the nine of us included one senior, three, sophomores and five juniors. So at the end of the year, since one of our a group had been kicked out and she was a junior, 11th grader, and Ernie had graduated, he was, in, um, he was the only senior. Now there were seven of us who were left. 
all of us who are, the other four of us who were juniors left town. We went to other places. Two of us wound up in California. And that left the three uh, sophomores. They all went someplace else for their 11th grade year, but two of them came back to Little Rock and entered Central when the schools reopened for the school year 59-60. In that year, there were five black students and that number five included two of the ones who had been in the original group of nine and they uh, graduated. So of our group of nine, three of us are bona fide graduates of Central. All nine of us are honorary grads with rings and everything, class rings. Although since I, I really don't wear jewelry, I, I never wear a ring. So I have it someplace in a box somewhere. Probably wind up in some archive. Historians in the future will look and say, oh, that was his high school ring, I, I suppose. We'll want to look at it though. Oh yeah. So the people are asking, um, are, did you keep in contact with the other eight students um, after you guys finished up and how long did you keep in contact with them? Well, there are only um, eight of us alive. One of our group died about 11 years ago now. That was Jeff Thomas. But immediately, even in 57, 58, we uh, sort of coalesced as a group. And we were, we were sort of given this name, the Little Rock Nine, by some news reporter. And that became something that stuck. So a few years ago, we created something called the Little Rock Nine Foundation. And all of us are board members. So we still have a relationship ongoing. I'm in constant contact with each one of the remaining eight uh, seven, uh, I <laughs> yeah, get my math right. So one of our group lives uh, in Canada and the other lives in Sweden. So two of us live outside the continental US, but the other five of us are someplace in the States. Yeah, we, we're in touch all the time. You can look us out, check out the Little Rock Nine Foundation, by the way, and send gobs of money too. Um, we, we'd love that. One of the questions we have um, is from Zeline, and she asks, at any time, do you feel like you made an incorrect decision to volunteer to go to Central and why? Well, no, that's an interesting question. And by the way, that's the first time I've heard that question. Um, incorrect decision. No, uh, I don't think so. Um, in fact, I know so. No, it wasn't incorrect. It was the only possible decision to be made at that time given the craziness that was going on. Uh, you know, when you look at something and you see how crazy it is, you wanna do whatever you can do to restore it to sanity. And that, and that was my position. My going to Central High School was basically modeling law abiding behavior. The new law said black people had the right to attend Central High. A lot of people in Little Rock didn't think that was the right thing. They thought the law was wrong. I knew the law was right. And so I was there to demonstrate the rightness of the law. And so, you know, it wasn't, it was the, I would say it was the most correct decision I could have made. So this question comes from Angela Adams and she said, I loved your book, Lessons from Little Rock. I wonder if you ever considered writing it in graphic novel form like John Lewis did for his book, March. And she says, students seem to really respond to that format. Well, uh, that may be true. Uh, I've never had that thought. However, that's a function of who I am. Uh, I am a fan of not meeting kids with minimal expectations. I expect kids to learn and learn fast and learn continuously. Uh, graphic novels have never caught my attention for some reason. Um, I think. And again, this is all personal. You can do what you will with it, but no, no, it's my point of view and I'm not putting it on anybody else. Uh, I see it as a dumbing down rather than challenging people to move up and live in the cerebrum. Um, I get challenged a lot on this uh, because I know there are many people who feel that some things are just too deep, too dense for young kids. I don't, I, I don't have that. Uh, as an illustration, uh, my wife and I have two daughters, and sometimes a question is put to me, at what age did you start teaching your kids about the racist ideology in the U.S.? 
And I always respond with the truth, which is I started that conversation in utero while they were still in the womb. I got permission from my wife to speak through the membranes because this was such an important subject. I did not want to waste one second before these kids understood the reality of what was going on around them. They had to know, had to know. And because there was such a great need to know, I felt an urgency to get that conversation started. And I, my uh, truth about that was borne out in so many ways during my career. I can't tell you how many times I bumped into young people across these so-called racial lines who are ill-equipped because they simply don't know. Parents and others have refused to tell them the truth. They paint uh, what's called a blue sky picture for them. Oh, it's okay. You're just as good as anybody else. Just go out there and be yourself. And then they wind up confronting stuff they don't even understand. And they have nothing in their toolkits to help them. So I would suggest that kids who are, you know, enticed by the graphic novel do read them, yes. Um, and that's fine. And I can see from Julie Finch to all panelists that it's, it's not true that it necessarily dumps things down. And that's not what I'm saying. I said, for me, that's what I see. And that's important to know and understand. It, <laughs> I had a conversation once with a young man who is autistic and we were at his house for a party. And he found out that my wife and I did not allow our kids to watch television when they were young. We made a conscious decision not to even own a television because that stuff in our estimate was too dangerous. Dumbing down, oh, you talk about dumbing down, TV, yeah. At any rate, this young man was appalled because his dad would sit him in front of a TV to keep him quiet because he was autistic and TV worked for him. And it worked for him and I tried to explain to him that I understood that, but he took uh, a position that somehow I was suggesting that TV was bad for everybody. No, it was bad for me and my kids, absolutely. But that's one truth that need not be extrapolated to include everybody else. Because I made that choice does not mean everybody has to make that choice. In, in fact, that's something that I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about because too often people make choices based on what they see other people doing. That's dangerous. Never fear making a choice that deviates from the norm if you feel justified in making it. Well, that's the point. I'll stop there. All right, our next question comes from Kelly Steffen, and she asked, did you ever join any civil rights organizations? Um, I'm a member of uh, some so-called civil rights organizations, yes, even now, but uh, what does that mean? Uh, is there a meaning behind that question? I don't know. We can move on, though. Um, so this one comes from Redmond Jones. I think this is a good, timely question. And he says, I love presidential history. And as you know, out of our first 12 presidents, all but two owned slaves, John Adams and John Quincy Adams. What do you think um, that they are possibly least recognized for their contributions? Whereas a president like Andrew Jackson with maybe one of our most troublesome human rights records is celebrated. Our $20 bill is an example of that. Well, it's, it's hard for me to speculate on the whys of all of that. But again, when you look at the historical record, the fact that you just pointed out that all these men who were president owned slaves, you could stop right there and have a two week seminar on the meaning of that in terms of the solidifying of this train of thought, this development of an idea that white people had the right to own other human beings. I don't know if I've ever been in a classroom where this was addressed in frontal assault. Uh, we tend to gloss over it because it's uncomfortable. But I say that is why I preach that kids should learn history, they should know this, like you, they should have that as a given. Today, you can ask the average person about George Washington, they will remember the story about him chopping down the cherry tree and being honest about it. None of them will probably remember that he and his wife, Martha, owned slaves, hundreds of slaves. That gets lost in a shuffle, but that's meaningful. The fact that it's that way tells us something very critical. We have attempted 
to remove ourselves from the history that is ours. It is our history. And, that, and there's nothing you need to do about it. You don't have to clean it up or smooth it over. It's there, but you need to know about it and you need to understand the impact something like that can have centuries later. You see, all of history dictates what happens next. Today, if you don't understand history, you are ill-equipped to understand what's going on in front of you. And I think that's uh, what happens often in, in so many arenas. We make decisions based on the here and now, not understanding the historical relevance of how we got there. And so the decision-making is impaired. We really do need to make that an, uh, an imperative, learning our own history. In fact, whenever I go and speak to groups, my first inquiry is, how much do you understand of the history of this group to which you belong? Uh, I am a retired clinical psychologist. When I first joined the ranks of psychology, I went, well, even before that, I found out the historical background. Psychology has very racist backgrounds, as do most of the institutionalized forms of education that we have. How could it be otherwise, given the fact that our history contains so much of racist ideology at its core? But if you ignore that, again, you're ill-equipped to handle what's going on, or you ask questions that make no sense. It's easy to do that because, quote, everybody else does it. And I say, if you're not doing something different from everybody else, at least part of the time, you're not really growing. I think this is a really good and timely question. It comes from Heaven Chamberlain. She says, what would you suggest we do to further decide is still practiced and not being actively undone? And at least I can speak for Iowa. Um, we pay, schools are funded by how we pay property taxes. So there's schools in depressed areas that are not well, you know, not doing so well. And then there are schools in the richer parts of town that are, you know, excelling and there's still busing going on and stuff to try to, to deal with it. But um, it's definitely, you know, a result of, of redlining and how we fund schools. So that's the answer, right? Right. Well, I mean, I guess so, yeah. But so, so do you think it's like, we need equal funding across the board for all schools and then like neighborhood schools, like kids can go to the schools in their neighborhood instead of being bussed across. Well, you see, for me, it's not so much about those mundane details. The real issue is in this country, are we really concerned if anybody is educated? Is, if that is our concern, then we would find ways to educate every single person. That's, you know, all this other stuff, I was on a panel once, Los Angeles Unified School District invited me to sit on a panel. And the question the panel posed was this, what can we do to improve the LA Unified School District? So when it was my time to speak, I just spoke up and said, there's no way it can happen. You cannot improve this thing, it's too far gone. You gotta destroy it, get rid of it. Send all of the school age kids out of the country, stamp their visas, cannot return for two years. Now that was because in my estimate, kids learn by exp or exposing themselves to things that are happening in, in the world. Most of these kids in LA don't travel very much at all um, in, in public schools, that is. Wealthier kids, yes, but kids in public schools. So I thought they need to see the world. They really needed to see what poverty looked like in India and in Africa and other places. So for two years and then in their absence, those of us who really were concerned about education would rebuild the system and we would build it from scratch and the foundational principles would change. We would teach kids how to do critical thinking in grade one, start the process of teaching them how to learn, teaching kids how to learn early so they could really take advantage of opportunities to learn as they grew older. And institutions would not be set up the way they are now with all this levels of bureaucracy and people in charge who know nothing, who are making decisions that are idiotic. And then we would hopefully create a society of people who were 
critical thinkers who could analyze factual material. They could ferret through this, uh, the buzzwords and the sound bites and get to the whole truth of things much quicker. Right now, we're at the mercy of those who know that the majority of folk out there are not thinking at all. And you know, people who are hungry for power revel being in a society where people are not thinking because they can do what they want to do without fear. So this question comes from Megan McNeil and she says, given your stance on history, what are your thoughts regarding Mississippi finally taking down their flag and statues coming down in, in that state, obviously across the country? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's sort of symbolism. Uh, that's okay, I mean, I'm, I don't have thought about it one way or the other, really, uh, because I know whether the statue is up or down, what's happening in the heads and minds of the people has not changed. You know, you don't have to have a statue up to tell you every day this is how to think. No, the statue went up because of the way people were thinking. The statue will come down, people will, people will be thinking the same way. The real issue is not so much removing or replacing statues, uh, but to really convince people that it is truly in their best interest to start thinking differently. Uh, that's what I would say. All right, so um, I think we're probably gonna wrap up with this question, but I know it's really near and dear to your heart, so I think it's important. Um, do you or does the Little Rock Foundation work to uplift education standards and history or work to change or influence textbooks that are used in teaching history? Well, we, we most certainly try the best we can uh, to make that happen. It's an uphill battle. Um, I would, you know, I would actually encourage everyone here today to increase your reading by at least one book per week. Now, for those of you who are already reading 10 books a week, uh, this may seem like an imposition, but I know if you're already reading 10 books a week, one more isn't gonna hurt you uh, because you have the habit of reading. For those of you who read no books per week, hey, it may be a struggle, but try it anyway, because it's a great start. And I wanna recommend a book for you. It's a, a book written by Nancy McLean. She's a scholar. I think she's at Duke University, but the title of the book is Democracy in Chains. Democracy in Chains. Most of us don't know this, but there is a cabal of people in this country who are working like beavers to destroy democracy. They don't wanna change it, they don't wanna alter it, they don't like, wanna make it better for themselves. No, they wanna get rid of it because they see in democracy the seeds of everybody being involved in the process of governing. They don't want that. They want to go towards something that we would, I think, probably call a monarchy, have a king or something like that. Not necessarily a king, but you get the idea. But with people like that beavering away underground, well-funded, by the way, as you'll find out when you read Nancy's book, it's an amazing bit of research. And if you buy that book for nothing else, get it for the bibliography. That will not only tell you you've spent your dollars well, but you'll have this treasure trove of other things to read. So if you're searching for a reading matter, start with Nancy McLean's book and then start with the bibliography and go plowing through it for the next hundred years. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I think like this, this will be a really good question too, and, and Megan McNeil sum, submitted this too, and uh, I think it's a good way to kind of close the circle for tonight. How do you feel that the decision to attend Central High School shaped your life um, after, of course, after you went there? Well, uh, my point of view on, on this is whatever happens in your life is part of the learning that goes on for you. So I learned a lot about myself at Central. I learned a lot about myself and others. I learned a lot about what happens at that intersection of me and other people. Uh, and that's what have happened other places as well. So Central just happened to be there. But I count it important to understand that wherever you are, you are making history. Often people ask me, how does it feel to have made history? 
none of us can do anything but make history. Every day we're living, that becomes part of the historical record. Now, many people don't realize that if you're not aware of it, somebody will write your history. Why not get ahead of the game, write your own history? Not that you have to write a book, but be so involved with life and understand your role in history that you make sure that people notice who you are based on what you choose to do. And you don't have to be, quote, in a high position, position of authority or position of power, anything like that. You just have to be the kind of person who chooses to speak your honest truth to all those around you without fear of saying something that others don't believe, but because get this, whatever you say, there will be millions of people who don't believe it, who believe something else. So you don't have to be in danger of speaking something that's not acceptable because other people see it as untrue. That's already happening. It's already happening. But you find the truth as you know it. And if it works for you, run with it, run with it. But do not abandon your application of critical analysis to anything that comes into your sphere of influence. Don't accept anything without checking it out, in other words. Making sure that whatever you use as foundational principles can stand up, can be shaken but not moved. That to me makes so much sense. Because if you really are a seeker for truth, you will find it. You won't stop at the point where somebody says, hey, this is truth, believe it, and you take it and run. Don't hope. Beware of folk like that. Oh, yeah. Somebody knocks on your door and says, I have the truth. <laughs> Don't be so quick to invite them in. Okay. Could be some huckster looking to uh, figure out how to separate you from your hard earned money, which is most often the case. But in any case, I, I think uh, learning is, oh, I can't express how important that is. And life is short. None of us are here very long. You know, your life on this planet is truncated. Everybody here knows the start date. My start date is December 3rd, 1941. You know your start date too. We have memorized this. We celebrate this date. Nobody knows the end date and they'll all be different. Uh, I'm probably closer to my end date than some of you just simply based on chronology. But the point is knowing that life is short should give you impetus to make the best use of the time you have. Don't fritter it away, okay? There's no time for frittering away. You need to be actively involved in seeking truth. If for the simple reason that you need to speak truth to those who come after you, your progeny, your parents, siblings, other people who have meaning in your life. And as your circle grows wider, a large number of people depend on you to grant them or bequeath to them what you've learned during your sojourn. So don't leave here with that task incomplete. Thank you. As we wrap up, I would like to encourage everyone to visit the online archives of the Eisenhower Presidential Library, the Clinton Presidential Library, and the National Park Service's Central High School websites, because they host amazing primary sources about the Little Rock Nine. I've provided those links in the chat box for everybody, so copy and paste them real quick. Um, and definitely go visit the Little Rock Nine Foundation's website as well, and keep up with what they're doing. Um, I also provided a link to the powerful segment from Eyes on the Prize that's on the Little Rock Nine and includes information about school desegregation and, and how it moved through our country. Dr. Roberts will join us again on August 11th for a session with students. The registration information can be found on the Hoover Presidential Library Facebook page and the National Archives Education Facebook page and website. Uh, that's all the time, uh, all the questions we have time for now. I also encourage you to come visit the Hoover campus and enjoy a walk around the park and explore the historic buildings. On behalf of all of us at the Hoover campus and the participating public libraries, we thank Dr. Roberts for his valuable time. We thank you at home for watching with us and we look forward to your next visit on the campus. Thank you so much everybody and thank you Dr. Roberts. My pleasure. See you later. Thank you.